genocide and commit more slander, hence the fear. Perhaps you could read it once more, Paul. Yeah. I literally had my head split into seven pieces by a car crash, former slander. How does one overcome the fear of past slanders? Although I must have shifted a lot of karma with that accident, I have a tendency to backslide and commit more slander. Hence my fear. fear uh, it's a really good question, isn't it? And uh, uh, I think the first point to be clear about is that uh, through this practice you turn heavy karma into light karma. The effect of every cause that one has made in one's eternal lifetime, Buddhism teaches, has to occur. There will always be an effect, but the effect can be incredibly light. So, uh, to give you an example of that, when I first started to practice, which was in Japan, uh, the, my leader was a young American that was in the international group in Tokyo, which was very, very small at that time. It had only just been founded. And uh, uh, this young American, who was 23 years old, uh, young to me, of course, I was 50, and he taught me everything about practice at the beginning. And um, he was a great chap. Anyway, one day he was uh, doing gongyo and chanting daimokure in front of his gonzon at home in Tokyo, in his room. And uh, when he got up, his legs, as, uh, as our legs often are, were totally numb. And he broke his ankle. Uh, because he couldn't feel his legs, you understand. When he got up, I'm sure some of you, when you've been kneeling, practicing, if you do kneel, uh, have often wondered whether you might break something because your legs and ankles and feet get so terribly numb. Anyway, he did. He bust his ankle and he walked around in Plaster and Paris for a bit thereafter. But anyway, he wrote back to America, uh, to his chapter chief in America, and laughingly told him what happened, you see. And uh, this chapter chief wrote back to him and said, do you realize what day it was that you had this accident? And uh, he hadn't thought that about this at all, but the day he broke his ankle in front of his gonzon was the day in which he'd had a very, very bad car crash the previous year, the same day, one year previously. And what is more, he'd had another car crash two years previous to that one, on the same date. So uh, this was such an obvious case of changing heavy karma into light karma. Uh, Gicho, Dr. Yamazaki, uh, who as you know is chairman of Europe, uh, he also has an amazing tale to tell about accidents because he and his wife both had a really terrible accident. Uh, many years ago now, 20 years ago at least. But it was a terrible accident and they were very lucky to be alive. They were both badly damaged and uh, Dr. Yamazaki was in hospital for 18 months and Mrs. Yamazaki was in hospital for longer than that. But anyway, uh, uh, he was, they both completely recovered thanks to I'm sure the prayers of all the members and also their own practice. Uh, and he really felt that that was it. But strangely enough, uh, this accident took place in April. Uh, and strangely enough, uh, April two or three years later, he was going on another trip by car. And one of the members in Paris <coughs> said to him, are you sure you're right to go on this trip? Because it was in April, three years ago, that you had this awful accident. Maybe it's a bad month for you. And I can't remember now what it was. Anyway, he decided not to go. He stayed uh, and did his trip, wherever it was, to the next month. But during that month, he very narrowly avoided, again, a bad accident, someone else driving the car. 
but it narrowly avoided it. So uh, both these examples to me are incredible, very positive evidence of the strictness of the law of cause and effect, but on the other hand, our ability to turn heavy karma into light. So don't, you, you have no need to doubt that whatsoever. <coughs> and there are many, many cases. In Japanese it's called tenju kyoju, turning heavy karma into light. This is a principle of Buddhism. Uh, it's a principle of life, therefore. In the most natural way, through this practice, you make great causes which change the pattern of your karma, turning heavy karma into light karma. So, of course, there's some karma we don't even notice. We've changed it. It happens almost without noticing it. Uh, the effect, whatever it may be, is so slight. But there is other karma that is heavy. But definitely you can change it. This is the point. And there are, I don't know how many tens of thousands of cases of people who've proved that that's what they've done. But it seems the worry of the question here is that although he says I must have shifted a lot of karma with that accident, I have a tendency to backslide and commit more slander, hence the fear. Well, uh, what can I say in answer to that? You have had experience of what it is to have heavy karma. So this should be a great driving force to that person who asked the question to really practice no matter what every day because that is how you make the causes to change heavy karma into light karma. None of us know what karma we may have. Just as well we didn't. Otherwise we'd be consumed with nervous anxiety <laughs> continually. But in the nature of, of life we don't know and that's just as well. But of course we may all have uh, karma of one sort or another that has to be changed. So uh, uh, please, whoever it is, ask the question. Please bear this in mind. The only known way to change heavy karma into light, uh, and since we've practiced eternally, uh, uh, sorry, since we've lived eternally, uh, we're all of us bound to have heavy karma of one sort or another. There isn't one of us who hasn't slandered in the past. So all I can say is please bear that in mind and jolly well make up your mind you're not going to be defeated by those devilish influences inside you and that you'll defeat the devil and continue to practice no matter what. There's no other way I can answer that. Except to say that in the Gosho it says even if a person practices only for a little while all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas will protect that person. So, uh, even if you've only practiced a little, still the Shotun Zenjin, uh, the influences of the universe, the beneficial influences, will protect you. But on the other hand, their protection can be that much greater. If you feed them every day, like I was saying this morning, in your gongyo, through your gongyo and daimoku. This is really the best way to guarantee it. But it is true that even if someone's only practiced a little, they will always be protected. That is because their Buddha state, their Buddha nature is awakened. So, uh, even a person, so the Gosha teaches us, who hears nam myoho renge their Buddha state will be awakened. Nijun Daishonin called it uh, a diamond chalice. That uh, uh, appears the moment you hear nam myoho renge even. And it will never, after that, go back and disappear, or in truth, go back into latency. The Buddha state, once awakened, stays awake, never goes to sleep or disappears. So, therefore, a person who has heard Nam Myorengikyo, they say, will always chant at some point in this lifetime. 
right? And Mr. Toda described it as being like radiation. If you hear Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, it goes into your system. Even though you may resent hearing it, it goes in and uh, uh, fills your, its vibrations fill your life and it awakens the Buddha nature in you. So, uh, therefore, uh, if you've had the good fortune to be able to chant Nam Myoho yourself, that's even greater. So, I feel pity to spoil it. Why not make up your mind today that you're not going to be irregular anymore and you're going to do it every day. This would be a good chance on this course to make that determination. I remember Eddie, uh, old Eddie Cahill, you all know him, quite a character, but uh, one New Year's Day he made his vow that he wasn't going to miss a gongyo from then on. And he'd always, for years, missed gongyos. But he made that vow, and he did it. And uh, his life really advanced. His happiness also advanced a great deal from that time onwards. In other words, he was determined from then on not to waste time with half-hearted practice. If you believe, uh, then go for it wholeheartedly. That's the best way to get the best out of anything, isn't it? Not only Buddhist practice, but everything else one does. All right, everybody, does that sort of answer that question? Okay. Just do, there's one more on slander. There are quite a few questions in different groups. How do you stop slandering someone you have disliked for some time because of the ills this person has knowingly done to you and still continues to do so? Mm -hmm. Just read it again. This is obviously about a relationship with somebody else. How do you stop slandering someone you have disliked for some time because of the ills this person has knowingly done to you and still continues to do? It's a, it's a reasonable question, isn't it? But the great example, of course, in terms of an answer to this question was often quoted by Nichiren Bashan in, in the Gosho and also derives from the Lotus Sutra, which is the Bodhisattva, Fukyo, who uh, had led what appears to be on the surface a rotten life because uh, for one reason or another uh, the villagers in the place where he lived uh, used to shout insulting words at him probably because he was a very holy sort of person. They used to throw stones at him and when they got a chance beat him on the backside with a stick and uh, shout insulting words and he always bowed to them and thanked them. <laughs> so this isn't like turning the other cheek. His reason for doing this was that he knew he'd slandered so much in the past and if he bore hatred uh, against these people who constantly persecuted him this way, he'd merely be compounding his karma and in the next lifetime he'd have to go through the same thing again. So this was why he bowed. Now I'm not suggesting that uh, in these times you can go around bowing to people that you hate. But what you can do is to bow to them within yourself. What I mean by that is that we have to uh, battle with the tendency to want to hate or dislike or slander. And the only way I know to do that is what I said this morning. You have to chant Daimoku to see the good points even in that person who's causing you so much of a problem. And you can do it. I'm saying this with conviction because I've done it myself as I said this morning. If you make up your mind, even someone who is making your life hell at the moment, you can turn it round by first seeking out through your practice the good points in that person. On the understanding, of course, that no one who is happy is going to behave in that way. They behave in that way because they're suffering themselves in one way or another. 
And therefore, you can look at them then as a bodhisattva in terms of when you're chanting Daimoku. Trying to understand maybe through your Daimoku, have the wisdom to know what the root cause of that suffering is and chanting for that person's happiness. So you'll be surprised how your feelings change if you decide to yourself that this is just another suffering human being. They may be making life miserable for you, but they're doing that because of their suffering. Therefore, you can turn things round. And once you start to chant as a bodhisattva for that person's happiness, your whole feelings about the matter change. I'm sure some of you have had uh, experiences of this sort of thing. So, and what is more, of course, the other person begins to react totally differently. They're slandering you or behaving badly towards you because of something in your own life which is drawing that out. Therefore, in the process of viewing that person as a suffering human being, you are also turning around whatever it is in your life which is drawing that sort of behavior to you. Do you follow what I'm getting at? So, this is the, the, the best and the only way I know. And you struggle in front of the Gonzan. You, you demand to the Gonzan to be able to have the power to get rid of those bad thoughts, those slanderous thoughts, even though the other person is slandering, and to kick them out of the way, as it were, and forcibly make the gongs and show you the good points in this person. And then base that relation, base your relationship with that person, even though it's a relationship that is very strained and really is only possible through the gongs and still through your daimoku for that person, you can change this whole situation. What they feel from your life will be totally different, therefore they will behave in a totally different way too. Is that understandable? Is it? <coughs> okay. Right. On we go on right. Else. There are a number of questions about evangelical Christianity, but I'm going to pick one that says... Number? Ni number six. Front page. Mm. Nikko Shonin said, Believers shall not visit heretical shrines. How should we regard the teachings and teachers of other religious practices? Is it slanderous to respect and study them? So, again, the question. Nikko Shonin said... Believers shall not visit heretical shrines. How should we regard the teachings and teachers of other religious practices? Is it slanderous to respect and study them? Uh, <clears throat> the answer is to that last question, is it slanderous to respect and study them, uh, is, is yes it is. But Buddhism is reason. And uh, what... Uh, in fact, Nikko Shonin said was that before uh, studying any other teachings or philosophies, first you should master the Lotus Sutra. In other words, first you should establish deep and strong faith. Then you can have a look, and he was specifically talking about the provisional teachings, the pre-Lotus Sutra teachings. But you must master the Lotus Sutra. That is to say, you must master... Uh, the teachings of the Gons and, uh, and the invocation of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo first and establish that faith deep in your life. So, uh, when it says here, believers shall not visit heretical shrines, uh, this is in terms of Buddhism. They're talking about Buddhism. Japan was a Buddhist country, basically. And uh, they're talking about the shrines of heretical shrines, meaning heretical in terms of Buddhism. That is to say, uh, Buddhist sects who were not following the teaching which Shakyamuni Buddha himself said was the right teaching for this age of the latter day of the law. Uh, that is to say, the Lotus Sutra. And instead were following teachings pre-Lotus Sutra, or even teachings which involved a, dis a, a distortion of pre-Lotus Sutra teachings. So, uh, 
uh, this is different in a Buddhist land to what we uh, encounter here in this country. So here uh, you can go into a church uh, but at the same time you don't join in to the service. If you join in to the service then you are repeating words which uh, are slandering Buddhism. But what you do is you go into the church, you uh, chant nam myoho renge kyo when you're all the time you're there, basically. So uh, all of us have relatives who may be Christian or uh, practice Judaism or one or other religion. So <clears throat> as I say, Buddhism is reason. It would be dreadfully upsetting probably to mothers and fathers if one didn't uh, attend family functions, weddings, christenings, all these things. Therefore, one should always accept and always go, but at the same time, uh, inside one, one can chant Daimoku when everybody else is saying their prayers or singing hymns or whatever it might be. All right? So, uh, let me just read it again and make sure I've covered it. Nikoshonin said, Believers shall not visit heretical shrines. How should we regard the teachings and teachings of other religious practices? Is it slanderous to respect and study them? You can only respect what you believe to be the truth in reality. You can't respect something which you don't see or believe in as the truth. So the truth uh, to one individual is the truth. What they believe in. Therefore, uh, you can respect the truth that you believe in. But you can't respect other truths because you don't believe they are truths. Do you see what I mean? So you've got to make up your mind one way or another. Uh, what is the truth, the ultimate truth of life? And uh, this dictates, of course, what religion you practice. However, Nikoshonin says, first master of the Lotus Sutra, in these times, meaning first master, Nichiren Daishonin's teachings and the Gosho, and above all, master our practice and carve it deep into our lives. Then you can study other religions. Right? That's the important thing. But so far as our country is concerned, the way we behave, uh, we can. Uh, of course go to Christian churches but we don't believe in it but we do it for the sake of the happiness of our mothers, fathers grannies, grandpas and the whole family hmm? I remember someone saying how can I possibly go to Christmas with my family how ridiculous of course you can go to Christmas and spend the day with your family uh, doesn't mean to say that you're be believing in, in Christmas as, as a, a religious festival, half the, more, two-thirds or three-quarters of the population don't think about Christmas these days as being as a religious festival in truth, even the Christians. So, uh, you could go and it's a festival day, a winter festival, if you like, you can put it, look at it that way, and go and enjoy the plum pud and the turkey and all the rest of it with your family and make your mothers and fathers happy. Hmm? Does that answer that? Okay, another one. Try 33. Yes. Right. <laughs> right, we're going on. Jumping on. Well, I'm trying to listen. Right, groups. that's great. What is the main difference between Nichiren Shoshu's Danto group and other Nichiren sects such as ours? Are we not fundamentally the same or is their belief, or is their belief in some way different from ours? What is the main difference between Nichiren Shoshu's Danto group and other Nichiren sects, such as ours? Are we not fundamentally the same, or is their belief, or is their belief, in some way different from ours? Well, I thought that we'd covered that in the talk this morning. Uh, there is, of course, a great difference. Uh, 
first of all, to get clear, the Danto group is a group of local people who assemble round the figure of the priest in that neighborhood or village. And the priest gives them a lecture once a month and uh, he conducts their weddings and funerals, not unlike Christian practice. Uh, he does the weddings and funerals and uh, they can go to him for advice but they have to pay for it. And uh, all sorts of other services they can offer. If someone's ill, they'll make a prayer but you have to pay for it and so on. This is the traditional Danto system uh, which is also practiced by the priests of Nichiren Shoshu. Other Nichiren sects, well, in terms of, I think, this question, the only other sect that we're concerned with is uh, Soka Gakkai. The other sect in uh, Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism uh, is the Hokeiko sect, which is linked with Danto. Right? But of course, to make it more complicated, beyond that, there are other Nichiren sects apart from Nichiren Shoshu. Shoshu means orthodox sect of Nichiren Buddhism. But there are other sects which are viewed by Nichiren Shoshu as heretical. And these were the sects, most of which were founded by those five elder priests who, after Nichiren Daishonin died, turned against Nikko Shonin for one reason, jealousy or for another, uh, and uh, refused to um, respect Nikko and to follow him as the leader of Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism at that time. So Nikko, in the end, uh, the situation became so bad in that area of Mount Minobu where Nichiren Daishonin's base was at that time that he had to move and he moved to the, to, to, towards Taisekiji where the head temple is now because he knew that in one of the Gosho Nichiren Daishonin had said that the ultimate sanctuary for the Gonsan should be uh, in that area at the foot of Mount Fuji. So he decided to take the Daigonsan with him uh, and leave the place where Nichiren Daishonin had lived in Mount Minobu. But there are still, for example, there is a Minobu a sect which is known commonly as the Minobu sect. And this is a, derived from uh, the, those five el one of those five elder priests who didn't understand Nichiren Daishonin's teachings. They didn't understand uh, that Buddhahood existed in everybody. And they didn't understand that Nichiren Daishonin was the true Buddha for this age. They, they really viewed him as a Bodhisattva. So uh, these other sects still exist to this day and are known as Nichiren sects, uh, but they uh, practice in a different way. They don't make gonsons as uh, Nichiren Daishonin inscribed gonsons. They draw little pictures on them and you pay more for the biggest, bigger ones that you can buy and less for the smaller ones and so on, rather like giving out postcards. And so they are very, very different altogether. So I'm not quite sure uh, the main, what is the main difference between Nichiren Shoshu's Danto group and other Nichiren sects such as ours. Ours meaning, of course, Sokugakai. So the Soka Gakkai is a, lay, is a lay society still officially of Nichiren Shoshu. As I said this morning, that is the title of the priesthood, Nichiren Shoshu. The priests form this uh, Nichiren Shoshu, which is a school of Buddhism. It's a better word than sect, I think. A school of Buddhism basing its, all its actions on the pure teachings of Nichiren Daishonin. Or that's what it's supposed to be doing. And the Soka Gakkai is a lay society uh, who devote themselves to the same practice as the Nichiren Shoshu priests and who believe in their mission to establish Kosen Rufu. So this is uh, what the Soka Gakkai uh, 
is all about, as we explained this morning. What is the main difference between Nietzsche and Shoshu's Dante group and other Nietzsche and Six that is ours? I think we've answered it really and all the talk this morning. Do you feel that's enough on it? Yeah. I think so. Right. Can we do that one as well? 28? Go on. I'm just doing the, the ones where there are large groups of questions. How should we think of and chant for the current priesthood? How should we think of and chant for the current priesthood? 28. Right. That's a good question. How should we think of and chant for the current priesthood? We have to uh, chant that they will find a way to purify themselves and that they will sift and get uh, rid of those who are impure. When I say Purify, I mean purify in terms of the qualities of a priest which Nietzsche and Daishonin uh, stated very clearly in the Gosho. Uh, I repeated them this morning. Uh, briefly, a, a person who has small desires and is content with what they have. Those were the very words he used. So in other words, people who are truly dedicated to teaching others the teachings of Nichiren Daishonin of working for Kosen Rufu and of caring for and nurturing those who are members and who are practicing as followers of Nichiren Daishonin this is uh, the idea of a priest according to Nichiren Daishonin and I think we can relate to that uh, because there have been great priests uh, in other religions who, who had something of that dedication and those qualities. And equally, I'm quite sure that there are people who already, who may be good priests with those qualities, if only they were allowed to reveal them uh, freely and not kowtow or bow to the customs of those who are not in that category, which they have to do at the moment because of the dominating position of the high priest. So this is really what we want, a pure priesthood who we can look to and respect and who in their turn look to and respect us and we can work in our true roles together. So the roles are very clear. Uh, the main task of the lay people is to practice and do their human revolution and spread the teachings. That is the main task for us. And the priest's task uh, is to uh, maintain the purity of the teachings and make sure that no one starts to go off rail, off the lines. So, of course, to do that, you need great knowledge of the Gosho. And it seems often that that is not the case in many of the priests. And it may be that their training or something has been uh, backward in that sense. I was surprised myself once when I said to a priest, oh, it must be so wonderful starting to learn the Gosho when you're very young. And he looked at me and said, no, nothing of the sort in Nichiren Shoshu. So we don't start studying the Goshu until we're already ordained as a priest. What we do is serve our seniors. That is the way they do it. So uh, maybe this is one of the reasons why they've gone off the rails. Too much concentrating on uh, a hierarchy. There are 17 layers of hierarchy in the Nichiren Shoshu priesthood at the moment. Incredible. So everyone's looking up to a senior all the way. And they have to serve them and obey implicitly. This is why the priests have found it difficult to stand up yet. Because the high priest has absolute power over them. If they cross him in any way, he can cut them off uh, and of course place them in very difficult situations because most of them, all of them nearly are married 
all and they have children and so on. So they're scared. I don't think that will go on. One day someone will stand up. And this is what we need to chant for. Some great priest will stand up and lead them out of this horrible, poisonous swamp that they seem to have got caught up in. And we want it fast, don't we? We don't want this thing to drag on and on and on. We want it as soon as possible. I'm sure it'll happen. Uh, because I'm sure this has all happened for a purpose. So that we can really have a fantastic movement moving into the new century that starts so very soon. Okay. Yes. Well, it may, it may seem so to you, and I think it would seem so to me, because I don't look upon myself as a particularly priestly character. But there are people, you know, who do have small desires. You don't only find them amongst priests, uh, you find them amongst poets and writers, artists, who are so devoted and dedicated to their art that they don't worry about any material benefit so much. So uh, there are two people who are very strong spiritual feelings who, who can fit that bill. But what I'm sure of too is that Nijan Daishanin wouldn't have said that unless it was a, a statement which would last forever. In other words, there always are such people. And if they are encouraged, I can quite see, for instance, that if you have a priest who matches that, it would be someone who would be, everyone would be drawn to. You know, one would want to look after him and care for him at the same time as he would want to look after and care for us. Do you see what I mean? I definitely feel that there are those sort of people around. Uh, and if that, uh, those qualities are emphasized and are indeed the conditions for becoming a priest, then uh, the people with that sort of uh, dedication will appear and come. I think probably uh, it's very putting off at the moment for such people because not only in Nitin Shosha but as I explained this morning the Buddhist priest priesthood generally are very materially orientated at the moment. Alright? Okay. Yes? Absolutely, absolutely, they should. And uh, uh, this, is a, this is a very good point, you know. Are they? Have they? Those who are behaving. But I, I must make it clear that this is a faction in the head temple. There is a faction in the head temple. It's not every priest, but there is a very powerful faction who are holding all the, the, the positions of power in the head temple. Actually, at the root of it, probably not more than four or five priests who are, of course, many others are bowing to them, but there are four or five priests in the most powerful positions. And uh, 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 so this, it's those people who are, who are the problem. So at some point, you see, uh, material, materialism is very corrupting. If you have a wife and children, for instance, uh, it immediately places uh, a great temptation. The wife is always wanting to sort of live up to the neighbors next door, if she's that sort of wife. Of course, he may have a wife who's as devoted and dedicated as he is. But the wife is also a mother. And the mother has children to look after. The children want to come back from school uh, and have the things that other children have. And so on. There are all these temptations. So it's very easy to be corrupted. Uh, I, I personally think that uh, probably when the priests didn't marry, that was more sensible, maybe. Uh, it was... 
an edict of the Meiji Emperor uh, for reasons I've never discovered that all Buddhist priests should marry. They weren't compelled to do so, but they were encouraged to do so. I wonder why. What were they up to? Why did they say that? So the rulers of Japan, as I explained this morning, had deliberately corrupted priests before. Was this a cunning move? Nobody knows. But anyway, I certainly think that it makes the problem of a priest who is dedicated very difficult. One of my best friends, uh, uh, who I grew up with from a, uh, virtually a baby, uh, was, was a, uh, a priest in the Church of England. And he was always poor. A lot of priests are very poor. But his struggle and agonies over his wife's requirements and her needs for... They had four children. Funnily enough, priests often seem to have lots of children, even though they're so poor, in the West anyway. But they had such a struggle. And this was his endless agony, really. Uh, I didn't see him so often in later life. But whenever I did, you know, he would tell me what an awful agony this was. And of course he married when he wasn't a priest. Actually, in this case, he, was, he, he, mar he, he married during World War II, when he was a soldier. And then after he came out of the army at the end of the war, uh, he decided he wished to be a priest. So to make it worse for him, uh, you know, his wife in a way, I think, felt betrayed. Because he decided to take on this career and he wasn't the man anymore that she married. That was the way she looked at it. So I think they, you know, they do face many problems. I don't know whether the Catholic Church is more sensible having celibates but on the other hand, there are plenty of things you can criticize about celibacy too. So uh, probably there's no perfect answer. But what is needed uh, is, I guess, the right person who's really devoted. And there have been, of course, in a lot of religions, great priests. They've been in the minority, but definitely they've been there. And I think, if Nich my belief is, if that's what Nichiren Daishonin said, the people are there, and if the intention is right, the causes are right, they'll appear. That's what I feel. Because I haven't found anything else he said that was incorrect. Okay? Yes? Yes. Yeah. 